All right, if you have your Bibles today and you would open them with me to the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. I've told you before, Acts is the continuation, as it were, of Luke's gospel. Luke, the Gentile physician, one of the Lord's twelve anointed, appointed, called apostles. Luke continued his gospel account and he went past the Lord's resurrection and his ascension and he shared much of what went on in the early church. He shared much of what he saw, what he experienced, what he heard during the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul because Luke traveled with the Apostle Paul quite a bit. And many of the experiences that Luke writes of concerning Paul, when you read in the book of Acts, about some of Paul's shipwrecks and some of Paul's imprisonments and stuff. Got news for you, honey. Luke was right there with him. Amen. He went through the fire with him. But this is the only historic record we have in the Word of God concerning the first century church. So it is extremely important. There is so much important information to be gleaned from the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 16, beginning today at verse 23, and we will read through verse 33. The word of the Lord today reads, And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in, and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. If you bow your heads with me another moment, Master King Jesus, what a wonderful, wonderful presence of God I feel right now. Thank you, Lord, for lifting our spirits. Thank you, Lord, for encouraging us and helping us to find a better frame of mind in a better place, O oh God, than we may have come into the house of God with today. Our troubles bound about us like an anchor. 
our troubles, our trials today, oh God, causing us great distress. Oh, but Lord, as we sing the songs of Zion, as we sing the great anthems of the church, our spirits are reminded that we serve a wonderful God, a great God, a mighty God. And Lord, today our hearts are lifted up by your presence. And even now as our hearts have been prepared through worship to receive the word of the Lord, I ask God now that the Holy Ghost from heaven would go before me. Even before a single word is spoken, go before me, O God. And touch the heart of every hearer of those who are watching live, those who will listen and watch later. By reason of the internet, touch our spirit, touch our heart, cultivate that ground, O oh God, that it might be ready to receive the engrafted word. Let it not fall upon stony ground where it is unable to take root and prosper. Let it not st fall among thorns today, O oh God, where the seed might begin to grow but then become choked out. Let it not fall today upon hard ground where it is unable to take root and the birds come and take away the seed. But rather, O oh God, let it fall upon good ground, ground that is ready, able, and willing to receive the word of the Lord. For Lord, it is our desire today as the people of God that every seed of your word might be planted and that it might grow and that it might bring forth fruit unto righteousness in our lives for your name's sake. Touch the lips, the mind, the heart of the speaker today, O God. Help me to do justice by your word. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious saving name. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. You know, we often find ourselves in the most difficult and yes, often undeserving of places. I don't know about you, but I know the enemy loves to come against my mind and try to convince me that every time something bad happens, it somehow is my fault. You know, the enemy loves to play that game with God's people. Well, see, it's your fault that you're going through. You must have done something. You must not be doing something right. You must not be preaching something right. You must not be on the right path or doing the right thing because look at all the calamity and all the trouble and the turmoil and the tribulation that has come upon you. But I'm here to tell you today, saints, the Word of God said, Yea, and all they that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Got news for you. It's just part of the process. It is going to happen. It is no one's fault. Amen. You need not buy into that demonic devilish lie that somehow you brought this trouble upon yourself. No, the Word of God said the Lord allows it to rain upon the just and the unjust. He causes His sun to shine upon both the evil, the wicked, and the righteous. Amen. Good and bad things happen to good and bad people. That is just part of life. A lot of times we'll find ourselves in these situations difficulties and troubles and we're motivated to look toward heaven and cry out why me Lord <laughs> there's an old song by Chris Christopherson that I remember come out back in the 70s and my mother loved this song when it come out why me Lord but it was not a lamentation. It was not a, a weeping, you know, poor me. That's not the message of the song. The message of the song was, Why me, Lord, what have I ever done to deserve even one 
of the pleasures I've known. Amen. So he wasn't asking why me, Lord, is all this trouble. He was asking why me, Lord, have you been so good to me? Amen. But many times in our troubles and in our difficulties, in our trials and in our tribulations, we want to look up toward heaven and say, why me, Lord? What have I done? Oh, God. And we want to wallow for a moment in self-pity. That's just human nature. Oh, Paul and Silas were in prison. They'd been thrown in prison for nothing more than preaching the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then a demon-possessed woman who uh, had a gentleman who kind of sponsored her. It's kind of like having a psychic, you know, who's got a little... Uh, shop set up in town and they got a little storefront sometimes you see these as you're driving around and you see a psychic's got a storefront and everything well in this case this little lady was kind of like this and she had men who kind of put her in business you know they sponsored her and therefore they were subject to a part of the profits and the proceeds that she brought in and this woman was following Paul and Silas around and she was listening to them preach and she was actually amening everything they said. She was saying, yes, these men preach the truth. These men are telling the truth. I'm going to tell you, there is something to be said for the wrong people amen and in the church. I'm going to tell you, you don't, you know, preachers, us Pentecostal preachers, we like it when there are people in the church who affirm what we're preaching. When they say amen, praise the Lord, preach it brother. We like that affirmation. But I'm going to tell you, sometimes uh, the wrong person affirming your message can in turn send the wrong message. Sometimes if people in town know that that person is a hypocrite, that that person is a heathen and they're not living this thing the way they ought to be living and they visit your church and they see old brother hypocrite sitting there, amen in everything you say, it winds up negating what you're saying because the wrong person is supporting your message. Well, in the case of Paul and Silas, this was the situation. The wrong person was doing the amending, and it was not helping their cause. And after several days, finally Paul got the go-ahead from the Spirit of the Lord, and he turned to this woman and he called out the Spirit that possessed her, the demon that worked within her. And he called it out and he cast that demon out of her. And all of a sudden, boy, she was set free from that demon. But with that demon went her abilities. Uh-oh. Now, all of a sudden, she can't do what she used to be able to do. And the men who were making money off her weren't real happy. And so they went to the authorities and they trumped up some charges so that they could get Paul and Silas arrested. And Paul and Silas wound up in jail. Through no fault, no fault of their own, they hadn't done anything evil. They hadn't done anything wicked. If anything, they had only done good. Sometimes even doing the best you can do, you wind up in trouble. Sometimes even doing what God's called you to do. Things can go backwards and they can go awry. And things can happen that we would much rather not happen. And before you know it, you find yourself in prison. Prison represents, if nothing else, it represents a complete and total loss of control. Have you ever been in a position where something's going on in your life and it's like you're in jail. You just don't have any control over nothing. There ain't none of it. You, you, can't, you can't determine nothing. You can't determine when you're going to eat. You can't determine when you're going to sleep. You can't determine nothing. No, because when you're in prison, all of those things are at the mercy of those who are in charge and those who are in control. And all of a sudden, you find yourself in a position where you're completely and totally without control. 
And then most of us start singing our pity song. Why me, Lord? Why me, Lord? Oh, Lord, I'm a suffering Jesus. All I ever wanted to do was the right thing. I've always been a good boy, Lord, but now you're letting me go through the fire. And there we go with our pity party. One of the wonderful things about the Holy Ghost is the Holy Ghost often inspires in us that which is contrary to human nature. Say, what do you mean by that, Pastor? What I mean by that is this. Sometimes in our trouble and in our trial and in our difficulty and in our tribulation, the Spirit of the Lord will come along and the Word of God said that God gives us songs in the night. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden, when everything is looking dark, and everything is looking bleak, and you can't see the forest for the trees, you can't see the sunlight for tomorrow, for the darkness of today, all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord will drop a song in your heart, and you find yourself singing. Singing is an expression of joy. And all of a sudden, you find yourself expressing joy. You find yourself expressing thanksgiving. Yeah, Lord, I may be in prison today. I may be going through something I have no control over today. Oh, but there are so many things you've done for me. You come to church and we begin to sing, He's done so much for me. I cannot tell it all. I cannot tell it all. I cannot tell it all. He's done so much for me. I cannot tell it all. He has taken my sins away. And all of a sudden we get, you come into church and you're feeling down and you're feeling depressed and you're feeling awful. And we start singing some of them old songs. And we start singing about things and we start remembering. And it reminds us, wait a minute, God has been, I've been here before. Hallelujah. I've been down this road before. Ain't like I've never been between a rock and a hard place. I've been between a rock and a hard place more than once. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I can tell you a story about being between a rock and a hard place. When Tommy and I found ourselves needing to look for a new house. And I mean, honey, we didn't have much time to work with. Well, our situation came upon us so fast that our head was spinning. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know how to go about it. We didn't know exactly what direction to take. Long story short, because I don't want to tell the whole story, but in a matter of a month's time, God gave us financing. God found us this house. He got us approved. He got the owners to accept an offer on this property that was mind-boggling, and we wound up closing and moving into this house that we're in right this minute within a month's time. Now, Tommy's been in the mortgage industry for many years. He can tell you, I can tell you, I have a real estate license in New York State. While I was living in New York City, there was a time when I worked as a real estate agent. I can tell you right now, sweetie, uh, very few people find a house get financed for a house, close on a house, and move into a house inside of 30 days. Very few people. But God did that for us. We were between a rock and a hard place. I'm going to tell you, we were, well, we were in a pressure cooker. It, it didn't feel good. Remember that, Booby? <laughs> I know it didn't feel good for me. I know that for a fact. It didn't feel good. But I'm here to tell you, God is able. And sometimes when we come to the house of God, the Spirit of the Lord will put a song in our heart and we begin to sing the words and the words remind us of what the Lord has done and all of a sudden our faith and our hope is encouraged and renewed. The Bible said about midnight, Paul and Silas were in prison and instead of blowing up balloons and getting set up for a pity party, the Bible said they began to sing and they began to pray. Hallelujah. 
And they weren't just, you know, I'm trusting you, Lord. I'm trusting you. You've been so faithful. You've been so true. The Bible said they sang loud enough so that the prisoners elsewhere in the prisons could hear them. Oh my goodness. I know the Lord will make a way for me. I know the Lord will make a way for me. I can just see them, boy, I mean to tell you. <laughs> see, you only sing under your breath when you're defeated. You only sing under You only sing under your breath, honey, when you can't see the miracle in the distance. But oh, Paul and Silas, they weren't singing under their breath. <laughs> they were singing at the top of their lungs. Glory to God. I'm going to tell you something about the God we serve. The God we serve loves people who can sing at the top of their lungs when they're in the middle of a circumstance that they hate. He loves people who can sing at the top of their lungs when they're in the midst of a circumstance over which they have no control. He loves people who who can sing at the top of their lungs when the world would look at them and say, you should be doing anything and everything but singing right about now. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden the word of God said an earthquake began to shake that old prison so that even right down to the foundation to the deepest level of that jail Every door was shooken open. And all of a sudden, all the cells were wide open. And the prison guard who had been charged with keeping these prisoners steadfast and secure wakes up from his sleep as the earth underneath him is shaking. He looks about him and sees all these doors open all these prayers. and he thinks oh dear God all these people have escaped I'm going to tell you the Roman armies were very strict and a lot of times if you did not do as you had been instructed to do the punishment for that was not court martial it was death and this Roman guard felt like, uh-oh, everybody's escaped, everybody's gone. He said, I'm just going to throw myself on my sword because I'm not going to let them torture me and kill me for failing in the task that I've been assigned to do. But as he was about to do that, old Paul called out from the prison, hey, don't hurt yourself, we're all still in here. Oh, I'm going to tell you... <laughs> Sometimes God will change our atmosphere before He changes our circumstance. Ooh. <coughs> what do you mean, Pastor? What I mean is, what is a prison but a place where you have no control? All of a sudden, the earthquake came and the doors were open. Guess what? Paul and Silas had control. If they wanted to leave, they could have left. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, when God opens the doors, honey, all of a sudden you're not quite so uncomfortable sitting where you're sitting because at least the doors are open. Hallelujah. At least you know if you wanted to, you could get up and leave. Glory to God. The Lord will change the atmosphere. Something changed. Did their circumstance change? Were they no longer where they had been? No, they were in the same place. But the atmosphere changed because the doors were now open. Oh, hallelujah. <sighs> Talking today about the prison is only a means to an end. I want to tell you there are times and there are circumstances in the which 
we are not distressed or troubled because of anything we've done or anything we have not done. But rather we are in the situation that we were that we are in so that the Lord might work his purpose and his plan through us. If we are the children of God, we ought to be able to trust him. We ought to be able to know that all will be well in the end. But God must have some greater purpose in our present situation. God's trying to do something. I'll tell you, there are times, friend, when that trouble you're in and that difficulty you're going through ain't about you. It's about somebody else. God's trying to do something through you to benefit somebody else. He's trying to reach somebody. I believe this with every ounce of my being. I believe this. I, I, when I was so sick back in 1999 and 2000, you know, and, and I prayed for a year and a half, I kept praying God had healed me, and I was not getting healed, and the Lord wasn't healing me, and I began to think, maybe the Lord just going to take me home, I don't know, maybe God just decided this is the way He wants me to go, I, you know, I, I was disappointed with that thought, but that thought, in all honesty, began to cross my mind. But then when I wound up in a hospital in New Haven, Connecticut, three times during the summer of 2000, and I'm laying there at one point, and I've told you the story before, but for those who have never heard it, I share it again. And a group of students come in. It was a teaching hospital, Yale New Haven Hospital in New Haven, Connecticut. It's a teaching hospital associated with Yale University. And this doctor comes in with all his students, you know, all these young, soon-to-be doctors, and they're psychology doctors. They're psychiatrists and psychologists, and you know. And so their whole shtick is uh, how people are thinking and how they're feeling and what they're going through. And so this doctor tells me, he says, now, Mr. Mara, you're aware that you may die. And I said, yep. Yeah. He said, uh, how do you feel about that? And I said, well, it goes like this. For me to live is Christ, and for me to die is gain. I said, one way or the other, either way I go. If I live, I live for the Lord. If I die, I'm headed to heaven. I said, so I'm okay with it either way. And of course, you know, these medical type, these scientific type, they think you're just puffing a bunch of hot air. You know, you're trying to put on a show for somebody. And so he questioned me further for a while. We talked all the, there must have been eight, ten different students with him, you know. And then after a while, they left. And a couple hours later, here come one of the young men that was with him, one of these young doctors. He comes back to the room, and he sits, and he's talking to me in my room. And he said, can I ask you, sir, he said, do you really believe what you were saying earlier? I looked at him, I said, oh, honey, you better know I do. I said, I surely do. He said, but I mean, you really, really, really believe that? And I said, yes, sir, I do. I said, I'm going to tell you something. I've been preaching this message for a lot of years, and I've had a relationship with God all my life. I said, I want to tell you something. He's as real to me as the nose on my face. I said, uh, whatever's going on right now, I know he's in charge. And if I live, I live. If I die, I die. I said, but either way, there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And I already bought my ticket to heaven, so I ain't afraid of hell. I said, I'm ready to go. And that young man sat there and talked to me for literally, I think it was about an hour or two. And then after a while, finally, he said, well, you know, he said, I, I need to go. He said, but honestly, he said, I have never, we have never come across anybody like you that 
reacted to the concept of dying the way you did. He said, honestly, you shocked us, all us students. We were all shocked. He said, we've seen people go into tears. We've seen people go hysterical. We've seen people get angry that, that, they, that uh, the doctor would even ask him that question. You know, he said, we've seen all kinds of reactions. He said, but we have never seen anybody react the way you did. He said, and i got to be honest with you. He said, I had to come back and talk to you further. He said, because I'm, I'm just amazed. I've never seen anything like it. And I said, well, I don't want to get you into trouble. You, you know, I don't want to tie you up on your shift. He said, oh, no, no, no. My shift ended almost an hour ago. That young man had come in and sat with me and talked and talked and talked. Something in him had to be hungry. Something in him had to know what it was that was creating this hope within me of heaven. For all I know, for all I know, that entire experience I went through was for him. For all I know. Tommy's got some health issues. I wish the Lord would heal him. Looks like he may wind up having to go under the knife by the time it's all said and done. I've tried to tell him, I said, let me tell you in my experience, let me tell you what I've realized. I said, God may want you to go through the surgery simply because he, he wants to communicate to somebody. He wants to talk to somebody. He needs to touch somebody. He needs to reach somebody. And the way to reach them is not merely by them having a conversation with somebody, but by them having a conversation with somebody who's in a really bad place or going through a really difficult experience or a really difficult time. You see, a lot of times, folks, words, just simply will not do the job. Sometimes if people are going to be reached, it's not, you know, that, pr that prisoner could have bumped into Paul and Silas on the road and he'd have never asked them, what must I do to be saved? But it took them being cast into prison. It took them being in that dark, dismal, depressing situation for that prisoner to be able to experience something that caused him to ask them, where does your hope come from? Hallelujah. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I want to tell you, sometimes the prison is only a means to an end. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, I constantly am quoting this. The Word of God said, And we know, not we believe, not we hope, not we think. Paul said, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called. Listen, according to His purpose. See, the problem is when God's purpose doesn't line up with our purpose, uh, we start wanting to argue with Him. But as children of God, <coughs> we're supposed to be open and we're supposed to be submissive and surrender to His purpose. So that means if His purpose requires we go through this valley, then okay, Lord, I may not like it, I may not enjoy it, but I'll go through that valley because my life is about fulfilling your purpose. There's going to be some greater purpose in that prison experience. There's going to be something that you accomplish by my spending some time in that prison that would not be accomplished otherwise. Am I telling the truth? Oh, I want to tell you, Lord, I understand that the prison is only the means to an end. In Psalm 37, 23 through 25, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. And he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. 
Then David the psalmist says in verse 25, I have been young and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Hallelujah. You know, we love at times of death and sorrow and mourning. We love to read the 23rd Psalm. But honey, I'm here to tell you, the 23rd Psalm has more import for the living than it does the dead. Hallelujah. For the 23rd Psalm declares, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, sometime when you're in prison, you need to read the 23rd Psalm. Sometimes when you're in that dark place and you feel like everything's out of control, you need to read the 23rd Psalm. Amen. Don't wait till your funeral and somebody reading it for you. You ain't going to hear it then. Amen. That is a reminder that God is leading. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. God is in control. The Lord knows what He's doing. He's going to take you to a good place. Hallelujah. When it's all over, it will be well. Hallelujah. Like the old hymn says, it is well with my soul. Hallelujah. Psalm 30 and verse 5, for his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Hallelujah. What does that mean? That means troubled times are only going to be short-lived. Amen. No matter how dark it gets at night, the sun always comes up the next day. Amen. I've written, I love to write poetry and stuff, you know, and I've written some po poems over the years and some things that talks about the fact that when people get discouraged and despondent and depressed and we feel so down at our current circumstance, honey, you've got to remember, you've got to remember, you've got to remember, no matter how hard the winter, spring is on its way. There has never been a year in the history of the world, in any part of the world, anywhere, in any continent, in any country, in any city, there's never been a place in the world where a hard winter came and refused to leave. Hello now. <laughs> there's never been anywhere in the world where the sun went down and the next morning it decided it wasn't going to come up. And it took a few days off and stayed below the mountains. Hello now. Stayed below the, uh, the, the horizon. No. The sun's going to come up. Hallelujah. There's an old song that said, The sun's coming up in the morning. Every tear will be dried from our eyes. Glory to God. I got news for you, honey. Trouble only lasts a certain amount of time. It cannot last forever. Now that doesn't make it any more fun while you're in it. That doesn't make the prison any more joyous while you're there. But know that at some point, either by reason of your sentence or by reason of God's intervention, 
you are going to get sprung. Hallelujah. Lastly, this afternoon, Psalm 34, verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, the prison is only a means to an end. Joseph was sold into slavery. He was sold into a dismal, dark, depressing situation, and he had no control over it whatsoever. And he found himself in a bad place. But by the time it was all over, Joseph found, him, found himself sitting next to Pharaoh. Hallelujah. Joseph found, oh my God, have mercy. If that don't make you want to shout, nothing will. Joseph found himself in a place where he would be able to rescue his entire family from famine and death and destruction. Oh, but see... The whole time Joseph was going through that prison experience, he didn't know that the prison was only the means to an end. Hallelujah. Oh, Daniel wound up in prison. Thanks old Potiphar's wife. You remember the story. Did Daniel do anything? Did Daniel deserve to be there? No. Wasn't his fault. He was doing his best. To be the man that God had called him to be. It's not about whether or not you brought this circumstance upon yourself. A lot of times bad things happen to good people. Daniel found himself in prison. Oh, but before too long. Before too long, Daniel found himself as the highest and most highly regarded advisor to the king. Hello now. Oh my word and mercy. I want to tell you. He found himself rich and blessed and living a prosperous life even in captivity. Oh my God. I want to tell you why. Well it's easy because the prison was only the means to an end. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Sometimes for God to get us where he wants to get us Unfortunately, the, the best route and the shortest route is through the prison. Sometimes for God to get us where He wants to get us, the best route and the most direct route is through the valley of the shadow of death. Oh, children, I want to tell you today, the, the pit and being sold into slavery were only the means to a glorious end for Joseph. And not only for Joseph personally, but also for the entire family. Sometimes for the Lord to get us into a place for our next elevation, our next advancement, our next blessing. We must first pass through the fiery furnace like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We must first pass through the lion's den, like Daniel. We must pass through the pit of despair, like Joseph. We must pass through the prison, like Paul and Silas. But I'm here to remind you today, my friend, the prison is only a means to an end. Hallelujah.